Hey, it's Scott Tempesta from Sailing Anarchy. We're back with another retro video. This is a really highly requested boat, and we found a nice example of one. Today, we're doing the Olsen 30. The Olsen 30 is really one of the classic ULDBs from back in the day. I think 1978 or so is when they started. They built 250 of them, which is very impressive for such a specialized boat back then, but it really was, if it not groundbreaking, it was another leap in the development of the ULDB boats. These boats were light, they were 30 feet long, 3,500 pounds, 27 feet of water line, but this thing's over nine feet wide. I think it's almost nine and a half feet wide which for ULDBs coming out of Santa Cruz was pretty wide. And they did that for a couple of reasons. One was to be able to get more crew further outboard. These things are tippy. And if uh, any of you sailed on them, you know how tippy they are. When I used to race one back in the day with a guy named Gary Swenson from Allman Sales in Ventura, it was a boat called Boogie Boy. We were fast, but we were light. We only sailed with four people, which now if you went to do that, you'd be like, you get blown off the race course because you just need weight. You need six, sometimes seven, sometimes eight people on the rail of this thing. And that's a lot of people, because really and truly, ain't a lot of room to live right here. While these decks are really great for being healed, they're terrible for when the boat's not, because you're walking an angle. The tow rail is just horrible for killing you right at the, at the bottom back of your legs. And, and the area here to get through, not much room. So if you got people that are sizable, you got to give them a little time to get up and get, get out of the boat. These boats originally came with a single spreader rig which was problematic because not only was it just simply a single spread of rig, but the upper shrouds did not go to the very top of the mast. In fact, this boat has a conversion. So this spar originally had a single spreader, but they made a conversion kit where you could turn it into a double spreader rig. So you simply remove the middle spreader, you attach the new spreaders, the lower and the upper, and you can see on the mast right up there, the horizontal slot is where the original spreaders went, and then the cutout is where the lower shroud went. The problem is if you look even further up there, the hole that you see vertically underneath the white band is that's where the upper shroud attached. And you just didn't have a lot of mass control with this boat. You, you really didn't. The mass would pump a little bit uh, and then the tip would fall off in a bit of a breeze. So you couldn't really control the rig the way you would have liked to have. They solved that by going to the double spreader, putting the uppers all the way to the top of the mast. And now the boats, almost all of them sail in this configuration. And it's a much better way to control mast bend, mainsail shape, keeping the mast in column, that sort of stuff. Let's hop on board the thing, what do you say? So I had the pleasure of sailing on one of the very early boats, as I mentioned, and we got to learn a lot about the boat in terms of some of its characteristics. We came from a Santa Cruz 27 called Hotspur and then went into the Olsen 30 when they were brand new. And the boat was really a lot different in that it was a little more finicky, it was a little more high strung. It was certainly tippier than the Santa Cruz 27 and it had a weird thing that once the boat got going fast, the bow wave would come off of the bow and come and literally run all the way back to like the beginning of the cockpit. And so if you're going fast enough and the wave's high enough, like the wave would like, the bow wave would like break on the boat. And we'd never seen anything quite like that. And so we ended up calling it the design flaw, even though it was far from a design flaw. Um, but the boat had a couple of things that worked against it in a breeze. Fast in light air, always fast in light air. But in a breeze, it had two problems. The rudder was too small, so the bow would have a tendency to pop. It would just snap brooch quickly. Uh, a little bit of that was also because this boat, unlike the Hobie 33, that was really its competition at the time, this boat has a little bit more of a V shape to the bottom of the boat. So whereas the Hobie 33 has a flatter run, so it's a little more stable. So once this boat got up on edge, combined with that small rudder, a little cavitation, and a little bit of a V, the boat would just spin. The other thing that was a little tricky on this boat is the keel's actually really good size. I mean, the boat's only 3,500 pounds, and I forget how much ballast is in there, but it's probably close to 50%, but it's a big, long, kind of a bulky keel. And so you had to keep this boat into the wind nicely and you, in, in, in waves and some breeze because 
the boat being so light and the bow being virtually empty, it would have some kind of a tendency to get the bow knocked down a little bit. And as soon as that happened, the boat would then get overpowered and you had this big keel that seemed to be working against you. It's like, it was like drag the boat sideways. So the boat required a ton of finesse sailing upwind in any breeze at all. Guy I was sailing with, Gary Swenson, was just a master of it. So we had the boat going really good. People talk about the Hobie 33 now, and, and in the early days, the better sailors were on the Olsen 30. And the Hobie 33 wasn't really much of a direct threat because we were doing almost all windward lures. Now, a lot of the good sailors are on the, the Hobie 33s. A lot of them are modified. As you guys know, we did the uh, Captain Slogo Hobie, Hobie 33 in one of our earlier videos. But the Hobie 33s have turned out to be a better boat because, they're, first of all, they're three feet longer. That really helps. And then it's got a shape that's much more conducive to, to reaching and running. So the Olsen 30 has this niche, and it's really good in some conditions. But if you did a side-by-side -side comparison and you weren't sure what to do, no offense, Olsen 30 guys, you'd probably get the Hobie 33 on the boat. So while I'm in the cockpit, by the way, real quickly, I'll just show you how this, how this is to sit as a helmsman. And it's actually pretty convenient. I mean, yes, it's got these slanted decks, but again, when you're healed up a little bit, it's just fine. So you can sit right here. You got a little place for your toe. You play your traveler uh, as, as the helmsman. And you also do your main sheet quite a bit on this boat, especially when you're sailing with Ford like we did. And so when you sail with more people and it's breezier, you can have a guy trim your main right here. But this boat, you need one guy in and you need virtually everybody else hiked to keep it nice and flat going upwind in any kind of a breeze. Okay, let's walk up and take a look at the bow. All right, up here on the pointy end of the boat, and it is a pointy bow section on this thing, as, as I mentioned, flaring back pretty nicely to a relatively beamy boat uh, at the time, for sure. In fact, this boat is actually beamier than, or very close to, a Melgus 32, for example. So you can see how this boat was really not like any other ULDB in that sense. This is a pole boat, not a sprit. I've not seen any of these with prods, uh, although it would be really great to do like a, a J-boat style sprit, you know, that comes out 10 or 12 feet, then you'd have some major power on this boat. But as it is, it's a masthead kite and it's a good size spinnaker and the boats do really rip with kite. Going downwind, reaching, as I said, can tend to be a little, little tippy. What they did here is they put their number three jib tracks right here. They need to be in board. Uh, and there they are. They've made them adjustable in this boat. And then the regular Genoa tracks for a number two or a number one Genoa right there. One of the nice things about the punch tow rail is that you can use a lot. You can put twings there. You could put twingers there. You can move leads out board there. And so that's kind of a nice thing that some people don't take advantage of, but it's a, another way to increase your sheeting angle and move your leads uh, appropriately given uh, the point of sail. Let's go down below this thing, take a look. So here we are down below the Olsen 30. What you see is what you get on one of these boats and there, there's a real beauty to the simplicity of it, right? The boat is balsa core, by the way, if I didn't mention George Olsen designed it. One of the Santa Cruz guys, you know, who they just figured out how to make boats that went downwind really nicely. And this was certainly one of them. They went on to build the Olsen 25, the Olsen 34, uh, I think there was an Olsen 911. I'm pretty sure that's what it was called. They were all bigger, boxier things. I mean, they went away from this strict ULDB thing and made the boats a little higher freeboard. Not nearly as good of performance boats, uh, relatively speaking, as this. And then actually at the very end, Ericsson took over and built, the, I think, the last of the 34s and maybe the 911s. You know, you can only go so far with these boats in terms of what kind of audience you're going to get what kind of consumer are you gonna get that's gonna want one of these things? This boat, if I come a little forward, this is the chart table and nav station. This would be where the sink would have been if they had a sink, but they don't. And this would be, well, I guess you could put a little stove in there if you wanted to. Most of them hung a little stove here if they did any sort of offshore stuff. So the boat has a lot. It's funny how compartmentalized it is, right? You got a place to sit here, you got a place to sit here. The ice chest, as it were, is right here. This is a slightly different one. The boat came with a little bigger one, so you use it as a step and a place to keep stuff cold. This boat, you'll notice, has some extra reinforcement. 
So this is some pretty substantial material here that's tied into the chain plate along with these supporting wires. The boats were notorious for having mass step problems. That is, the mass would want to go through the bottom of the boat, so they built those up a lot, and this also helps support it. The deck on these boats was also a little flexible. There aren't a lot of stringers in this boat. I mean, sure, where the bulkheads are all attached, but there's really nothing going horizontal in the boat, and so this was just a way to keep everything tied in together to the mast, to the chain plates, and then to the bottom. This is now all class legal uh, for those of the guys that are still racing class. And there is a class. Let's not forget, this is a really, really popular boat, even to this day. And it's nice to see that the class allows some improvements on the boat like this. They also allow a, uh, a bigger elliptical rudder on the boat because, as I said earlier, given the small stock spade rudder, these boats were prone to spinning out pretty darn easily. Up there is a, is a four peak and a pretty nice one, but this boat was designed to go fast and designed to not have any extra anything in it. And it pretty much has nothing extra in it. Well, ex except me. So this is down below the Olsen 30, man. Let's talk about the holy grail of this boat, right? But before I do, stay to the end of the video because I'm gonna show you a boat that could be a holy grail for you. So this boat though, what is the holy grail? This is for a guy who wants to go racing, right? He might not be a top end guy, uh, but that's not necessarily saying top end guys can't come in and race these boats. The nationals for these boats are really competitive with a group of really good dedicated Olsen 30 sailors. This is a well-built, sound, light, and relatively inexpensive boat to buy from a used point of view. It'd be a stretch to say you could cruise on it, but hell, look at me. I mean, this is a pretty nice V-berth. You probably have a hard time explaining to maybe your significant other how they're going to use the bathroom, given that there isn't one. Maybe the, maybe the bucket in the sink doubles as one. I don't know. Uh, you could probably put a porta potty right there if you really had to. Probably put a curtain or two up if you really wanted to. Uh, burn some incense and go full hippie. I don't really know. But this is a good day sailing boat. It is a boat that you can have some passengers on. And it's a boat that you can race. And you can either keep it on a trailer if you're fortunate enough to have one, or keep it right in the water like this boat. That is this boat's holy grail. Good afternoon, my name is Brett Allen. This is my boat, Olsen 30, named Bamos. I've been sailing for 40 years. Owned everything from a Coronado 15 on up to a Catalina 42. I lived on the Catalina with my two daughters for 11 years, then met my wife. I became a landlubber, and we sold that boat, the Catalina. I lasted all of four months before I bought another boat, looked at a few others, and we decided on this one, and it's uh, been a lot of fun. I think they're well made. They sail well in light air, in heavy air. It's comfortable, relatively speaking, for this kind of boat. I wanted to stick with more of a retro kind of boat. I, I liked it. I think it looks good, it sails well. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. I think you can tell by my gray hair, I'm a little retro myself. And so I kind of grew up in sailing with this kind of boat. This boat is, what, six, 36 years old? And I'm sure it's taken a pounding up in San Francisco Bay Area, and it holds, holds together really well. And it's been a lot of fun. And I think they look cool, but hope to get out there and beat anarchy one of these days. Make sure you stay till the very end of this video because we're gonna show you what could be your potential holy grail next week. Best way to do that, hit the notification button so that you know when that video comes out. Of course, you need to like, of course, you need to subscribe. For Nobleman Productions and for Sailing Anarchy, we out.